Um, so firstly, um, I hope you've all enjoyed lunch and welcome back. Um, it, we're now going to do session three, which is looking at the comprehensive management of oncology emergencies within the central nervous system. Um, Catherine McBain is chairing this session, but she's running a few minutes late, so I said I would step in for a few minutes at the beginning, if that's okay. Um, my name's Claire, Claire Barker. I, I know quite a lot of you already because I've been a trainee at the Christie since 2014, um, but I've recently been appointed as a consultant in um, clinical oncology, specialising in brain metastases, but also pituitary and lung cancer as well. Um, I was one of two trainees appointed at the same time, so I work quite closely with my colleague in a job share, Jenny King, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, but quite often you get one or both of us at any one time, so we're very interchangeable. <laughs> so um, I'll just move on to the next slide now. I think there'll be a short video playing shortly. Hello. Uh, I'm Sally. I've been treated for stage four non-small lung cancer for over nine years, but it all started with a close brush with MSCC not far off 10 years ago. I've been clearing out a garage and heaving heavy crates over my head and into skips and didn't really think very much when I got a pain across the top of my back. Uh, and in fact, I was quite pleased because I'd been getting over myocarditis for a few years and I was actually back to normal and doing things. So pain to me was good. Um, that settled. A couple of weeks later, I got a low back niggle and it started with a bit of pain in my groin and down my leg, even as far as the ankle. Again, this was pain. It was new pain, but it was explained. So no, really not couldn't really be thought of as a red flag then. When I next saw my GP, which I was doing regularly for, for thyroid checks, I need to say to him, oh, this is, I might want to retire fairly early. I want to know if my back's in a really bad state because I want a few, I've got a few mountains I need to get up to. Um, so he said, well, I can get you a scan, but you have to go to clinic. Um, and the appointment for the clinic would have been three months from them. And mentioning it to my local colleagues where we have an MSK service, they said, well, come and register with us, which I actually really needed to do because I actually lived in the area by then. Um, so I was seen again, examined again, and referred for an MR scan direct from the GP, which was available in our area. So I tootled off for that at six o'clock one evening expecting to be in the scanner for 20 minutes and an hour and 20 minutes later with a few excuses about the coil I was beginning to think that maybe there was something wrong with me but the staff seemed quite cheerful and they let me go home but the following morning my GP rang saying I've got a scan result I knew there was something wrong. Little did I expect that there would be two spinal mets and the incidental lung cancer. It's very difficult. It's like, it's like as, a, as a medic, I had one hat on of this is this is METS at T12 L4. And with a patient hat on, I had my spine's going to collapse immediately. So it was, it was rather difficult to sort of assimilate it all. Things didn't really sink in until he said to me, this needs operating on next Tuesday, which was in four days time or the Tuesday after. But I don't want to leave it any longer than that. And I think at that point was the time I just sort of just total panic. Um, it dawned on me that things were really serious. I, surgery went incredibly well. I was mobile very shortly afterwards. I would say I was waddling shortly afterwards, but I did get back on my feet relatively quickly. Looking back, it's a very scary time. The psychological effect is phenomenal. And I do think healthcare professionals need to take a little bit more care in how they say things. Explanations are needed. I don't know because of my medical background whether people thought I didn't need things explaining quite so much. Things that could have gone better would have been just a bit more appreciation of the actual psychological impact of how it actually affects you. And I am very appreciative of the fact that this was caught earlier. But what does go through my mind is what would have happened if I'd waited for the appointment that my old GP was able to make for me, which was three months down the line in clinic, and that wasn't even the scan. So I think time is of the essence. Moving things quickly makes you panic, but moving things slowly might have had a totally different result. Okay, 
lots of things to think about in that video. So I'm going to move on to the first talk of this section, um, which is me, and talking about the management of brain metastases and giving kind of a, a, a talk, you know, a think about what the challenges are in the pathway with people that present with brain metastases. It's quite a broad topic to cover in 25 minutes, so I'm going to cover quite, I'm going to go quite quickly, um, but obviously we can have questions at the end of the session like previous. So a brief overview. I'm going to give an overview to the approach to the management of brain metastases, particularly focusing on what the initial management might be, who we should be referring to the neuro-oncology MDT, have a think about who might get surgery versus who might get radiotherapy in the form of stereotactic radiosurgery, a few questions, but I'm not going to pick on anybody just to keep everyone awake following lunch, and also talk about the challenges in the pathway, you know, using a few case examples. So a brief introduction, we know that brain metastases occur in about 20 to 40% of all patients with cancer. 50% of all lung cancer patients develop brain metastases at some time point. The incident is very, incidence is very much rising and will continue to rise. Most cases we see are three main disease sites, so lung, breast and melanoma. But of course, renal and colorectal cancer are also really important causes of brain metastases in adults. And in children, it tends to be slightly different, so sarcomas and germ cell tumours, but I'm not going to go into that today. This little picture here is obviously Bigfoot, and that's just to say, you know, historically you'd have had more chance of spotting Bigfoot than you would have seeing a patient with long-term survival with brain metastases. And historically that was very much because brain metastases tended to occur at the end of a patient's journey. Um, when the systemic disease was progressing, and they might have a prognosis of about two to four months. We used a lot of whole brain radiotherapy, and that was really designed to try and control the disease intracranially. But things are really beginning to shift, and that's because surgery's improved, radiotherapy has improved, the techniques have improved over the last few decades, and also systemic treatments have evolved and improved. So there's better control of disease, both intracranially and extracranially. And that's very much caused a shift. We're seeing patients younger and fitter with presenting with brain metastases. Of course, we're picking up a lot of people who are completely asymptomatic, either through screening for clinical trials um, or part of a radical treatment pathway prior to that radical treatment. And a lot of these new and improved systemic therapies don't go into the brain. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So actually, systemic disease elsewhere extracranially is really controlled, and it's the brain that is progressing. So we're a lot less pessimistic than we used to be about brain metastases, and people are living longer. You guys probably know better than I how people present, but generally you have you know, a lesion intracranially that slowly grows. It's associated with mass effect, and it eventually begins to kind of produce a gradual onset of symptoms. Much more rarely do people present you know, acutely with obstructive hydrocephalus and things like that, but it should really be suspected in any kind of cancer patient with neurological symptoms. Headache is a really, you know, common symptom and that's, you know, if you, it's more common if you've got multiple metastases within the brain or particularly in the posterior fossa. Focal neurological dysfunction, so weakness, you know, of a hemiparesis, obviously depends on exactly where the lesion is within the brain. Cognitive dysfunction in the form of personality changes, mood changes, memory issues. Seizures um, is almost always associated with supratentorial disease and stroke. So patients can, um, you can get hemorrhage into metastases, hypercoagulability from a cancer state or direct compression of an artery within the brain. Um, and of course, you know, the ones that are more likely to bleed into the Mets are things like renal, thyroid and melanoma. We tend to see more. How do you diagnose brain metastases? Well, Often a patient will present, you know, if they do present acutely with a seizure or a query CVA, they would do a CT scan. So you see a CT head, but really all a CT scan will show you is whether they have brain metastases or not. It doesn't provide any other additional information. So we very, very rarely make any kind of treatment decision without an MRI scan with contrast. CT scan doesn't show you the extent of intracranial disease. It doesn't tell you how aggressive you can be with management. It doesn't help you plan for surgery. It doesn't help you plan for radiotherapy. So really... Don't refer to the neuro-oncology MDT without an MRI scan with contrast because we just don't see anything on a CT scan. And additionally, it's really important to know what the disease is doing elsewhere. So you need a CT staging scan because you need to know whether the disease is progressing elsewhere and if really that's within the last six weeks. These images kind of highlight that point. So you've got a CT scan and you can see an abnormality in the left temporal lobe on the CT. They're the pre-contrast MRI scan, T1 images, and those are the post-contrast imaging. So the post-contrast, you can 
see a little bit more on the pre-contrast that there are a few more abnormalities in the brain, but it's the post-contrast T1 images where you really start to see the differences. The lesions massively enhance. You get, so they show up as the bright white. Oh gosh, that's not on there. There we go. Now you can see. <laughs> So you can see the multiple lesions that are enhancing that are white. You get the ring enhancement, you get the spherical shape, you get numerous lesions, and that's what really lends weight to the fact that these are brain metastases. You just can't see that on the CT scan and you can't see that on the pre-contrast MR. Um, and NICE guidelines are very much that you should have pre and post contrast on your T1 images. So these are part of um, some initial guidelines for brain metastases, which um, Jenny and I and Chantelle um, are creating, and hopefully we will get to you later on this year um, through the Acute Oncology Academy. And I don't want to kind of go over the point, but you know the clinical history, neurological assessment and examination. Those initial images we talked about are CT scan, but very much the MRI scan with contrast. And again, if they're known to have cancer, but they haven't had a staging CT in the last six weeks, that needs to be repeated when the patient presents. You need to be thinking, you know, are they known to have a cancer diagnosis? Are they known to have metastatic disease? What treatment are they on? And what is the performance status and prognosis of that patient? Like anyone else you see, you need to know the comorbidities, what they want and what suit treatment they would be suitable for. Um, and often that's gonna mean liaising with the primary team at the Christie. If they're not known to have um, a cancer diagnosis, you need to be following the cancer with unknown primary guidelines, which I know will be discussed a bit later on today. But again, you're going to be doing the same thing. You're going to need an MRI scan with contrast, looking at a CT scan to see where the primary disease is, and also liaising with local teams. If you've got a lesion in the lung, you want to speak, be speaking to the respiratory team because ideally, not only do you need that imaging, you want histological confirmation of what that cancer is. So, You've diagnosed the brain metastases, now what? And I think it's very important to think about how serious the presentation is and how serious the symptoms the patients are experiencing is. If you've got somebody who is asymptomatic, who's going about their day-to-day -day life, you know, you consider them in a green triage, if that makes sense. If some patients have got neurological symptoms, but they're still going about their daily, they're going about their daily life, they're in much more of an orange category. And then there's those patients that are really symptomatic from the brain disease that need to come into hospital for management with either kind of anti-epileptic medication for seizures or for steroids for symptomatic man management of neurological symptoms. And of course, there's those that present quite rarely, but with very serious and life-threatening neurological impairment, paralysis, reduced GCS and uncontrolled seizures. And your management of each is slightly different. Unfortunately, there's no one size fits all. Um, but here, you've got the green category. So an example of what a scan might look like is there. And I'm not sure if you can see, but there is a tiny brain metastases on that scan. Now, these patients are often asymptomatic. They don't have any neurological symptoms. So they don't actually need steroids. If you're going to give them 8 milligrams of dexamethasone twice a day, you're going to cause problems from the side effects of those, that steroid treatment. Um, and also, I think it's important to realise you don't actually need to refer to the neuro-oncology at MDT at that time point because there's no immediate kind of need for that. It's very much discussed with the primary team, see what the disease is doing elsewhere. The primary team can do a referral at that time point if indicated. Obviously, it's always safety netting a patient, advise not to, um, to drive because any patient, regardless of the size with brain metastases, should be advised not to drive. Those patients in the amber category... Again, you can see the enhancing lesion on the post-contrast T1 imaging. Um, but, you know, those kind of patients are going to need some steroids. But again, it might not necessarily be 8 milligrams BD. It might start more at 4 milligrams BD. Anti-epileptic medication. And again, it's discussion with the primary oncology team to see what the systemic disease is doing, what other options are available, and what that prognosis is. And again, it's not necessarily a knee-jerk reaction I will just refer to the neuro-oncology GMDT. It's thinking about all of those things and perhaps getting the team to refer once all those initial investigations and conversations have been undertaken. Safety net, do not drive. And again, these are the more serious categories. So for these patients with large, you know, large intracranial disease, a lot of swelling, a lot of edema, you are going to need to start the higher dose of dexamethasone, start anti-seizure um, medication if required. If you've got some really serious life-threatening um, concerns, so you've got significant midline shift, you've got hydrocephalus, you are going to seek urgent advice from the neurosurgeon on call. That's not somebody that it's appropriate to leave a week to discuss at neuro-oncology MDT. You need that advice quite quickly. 
Um, and again, liaison with the primary team and uh, about the, the known cancer diagnosis. So we've done that initial management, and I'm just going to talk briefly about kind of general further management of brain metastases. So it's, oh, it's really, really individualized, and that's because surgery and radiotherapy techniques have massively evolved, um, evolved over the last few decades. You know, as I mentioned, systemic therapy is much better, so you're going to get good control of disease intracranially and extracranially. Um, whole brain radiotherapy historically, historically was used, um, and it still does have a place. So if you've got a really high intracranial disease burden, you can still use whole brain radiotherapy to get control of that disease burden. But it's not given as an adjunctive to SRS or surgery over anymore. And that's because although it controls the disease within the brain, it doesn't actually impact on overall survival. It doesn't keep your functional ability for any longer. And it can actually negatively impact your quality of life because of neurocognitive concerns. So how do we decide who benefits from what treatment? And who should we refer to the Neuro-Oncology MDT? So the first question, and don't worry, I'm not going to pick on anyone in particular. So you've got a 45-year-old patient with breast cancer. She's had an MR scan because of persistent nausea. You've got four enhancing lesions. The largest is two centimetres in size. And your advice at the Neuro-Oncology MDT, if you were part of that MDT, would be SRS to all lesions, surgical resection for the largest, SRS to the others, whole brain radiotherapy, best supportive care, or other. And I'm not in the interest of time, I'm going to move on. <laughs> but the question it's a trick question. So the answer is other. And that's because we don't have any we don't have any information. So that referral has absolutely no information on the comorbidities, the performance status of the patient. We don't know anything about the breast cancer. So how you treat somebody who is performance status zero with a newly diagnosed breast cancer is very different from somebody who's had five or six lines of treatment, extensive disease in their brain, you know, in their in their liver, lung, and bone and his performance status three. So there's not enough information to decide how you're going to treat that patient. And that's because the treatment for brain metastases is massively an interplay between extracranial disease. So is that controlled? Is it controllable? Is it progressing? The prognosis of that patient, other treatment options, but also looking at the intracranial disease. So what number of metastases do they have? What volume? Where are the locations? Mass effect, certainty of diagnosis. And of course, like everything else, patient-related factors are hugely important. So comorbidities, what they want and their comorbidities. In the same way, you wouldn't necessarily refer somebody for chemotherapy if they were performance status three, you know, a nursing home resident with dementia. They're not going to have treatment for their brain metastases if those comorbidities are present. So all of that information really needs to be detailed in the MDT um, referral. I'm only briefly going to touch on this. Um, RPA, you know, being able to give a prognosis or have prognostic information helps us decide um, what treatment might be appropriate. So previously, the RPA score was used, a recursive partitioning analysis, which basically showed that patients had a better prognosis if they were younger, if they had good performance status, and if their primary disease was controlled, which kind of makes sense. Um, that has evolved over time to something called the GPA, um, I can't remember what that stands for right now. Um, but GPA basically also takes in, into, um, into consideration their primary disease, um, where that's from. And then finally, that's evolved even further. So it now starts to look um, and takes in mutation-specific information. So for instance, in lung cancer, it's looking to see whether you've got any mutations, EGFR or ALK mutations as well. Um, and that's all freely available online, so you can actually access that at any time point and with up-to-date information and prognosis on a patient. So, in a nutshell, when you refer to the MDT, you consider the prognosis and the treatment of extracranial disease first. So, that might mean liaising with a primary oncology team. But if we know your patients have good prognosis, we'll think about intracranial treatment options at that time point. But referral is not appropriate for everybody. But we know it is appropriate for some people, so aggressive treatment in the brain can result in prolonged survival, particularly for some subgroups. But how do we decide who gets what? So just another question to keep you awake. So six-year-old male or female, newly diagnosed adenocarcinoma of the lung, so it's locally advanced, good performance status, no comorbidities, they're very fit for systemic treatment, but they've presented quite acutely with headaches, vomiting, and an MR scan has shown um, 
with contrast, has shown a posterior fossa metastasis with associated hydrocephalus. So have a think about in the MDT, you're going to think about SRS, surgical resection, whole brain radiotherapy, best supportive care or other. So we do have quite a lot of clinical information in this question and they've presented quite acutely. So hopefully you've thought about the fact that this patient might need to have a surge, you know, might need to have surgery. Who do we operate in? Generally, those patients with large um, brain metastases causing raised intracranial pressure, providing they are, of course, of good prognosis um, and good performance status. Sometimes you might offer a surgical resection if the primary is in doubt and you don't have histological diagnosis. Um, and there's also some evidence to say that you can resect one out of a number of brain metastases um, for a therapeutic effect. So if it's causing raised intracranial pressure, and that tends to be for a slightly larger region, um, larger lesions over three centimeters in size. Um, if so, yeah, over three centimeters in size, if it's causing particular neurological problems in particularly eloquent area of the brain. And of course, in the posterior fossa, there can be concerns about disrupting the flow of CSF within the brain and obstructive hydrocephalus. So sometimes those lesions in the posterior fossa are also resected. Another question. You might know the answer to this one already, just through a theme. But this is a 76-year-old female. New presentation of synchronous lung cancer. Found to have a right frontal metastasis and a smaller left cerebral me cerebellar metastasis on routine imaging. You can't really see the cerebellar one there, but you can see the, um, the one in the right frontal area. Again, PS0, no neurological symptoms, no comorbidities, so very fit for treatment and has systemic treatment options, which has already been established. So in your oncology MDT, if you were going to offer local therapy, would you offer surgical resection to two, SRS, surgery resection to one and SRS the other, whole brain radiotherapy or best supportive care? And the answer to this is B. You know, you have small lesions um, and this patient would be suitable for SRS. So what is SRS? So it stands for stereotactic radiosurgery. And essentially what it means is the delivery of a very high dose of radiation um, via um, kind of stereotactic or image guidance delivered to a one millimeter accuracy to an intracranial target. Um, it tends to be given in one session. So it, you just come in one day, one session for treatment there and then. Sometimes we have to fractionate it, so give it over a number of days. So that can be three or five sessions. And the reasons we do that is if you have a larger um, brain metastasis or about three centimeters in size, or if it's really close to some critical, um, critical parts of the brain, essentially, like the brain stem, you want to try and reduce the dose that, that that normal, that critical area is going to get. So you might fractionate it over a period of time. It's very platform independent. So sometimes you hear different words banded around like cyber knife, um, gamma knife, linact base, SRS, but they all essentially are methods of delivering that radiation, that high dose radiation to the intracranial target. Um, it's just a method of delivery. The dose is the same, the side effects are the same, and the efficacy of the treatment is exactly the same. Now, SRS is commissioned by the NHS in the same way certain drugs or certain chemotherapy are indicated in certain circumstances. So that's why in MDT we might see that, say they're technically able to give, we can technically give it, but they don't meet the criteria, they don't meet the checklist to be able to give it, and that's why they've declined. So those are quite strict, you know, all patients have to be determined, you know, discussed and determined to be appropriate at neuro-oncology MDT. They have to have a KPS score of above or equal to 70. So that equates to a PS, a WHO, PS of 0 or 1 or a good, good P2, um, PS2. A total volume of brain metastases should not exceed 20 cc. And I'll come on to that in the next slide. They've got to have good systemic disease control, so controllable disease, other systemic tr treatment options, ideally, and a prognosis of over six months. So why do we say a volume of 20 cc? So the UK guidelines say that we can't exceed a volume of 20 cc. And that's really because when you're thinking about giving radiation, you've obviously got to weigh up the pros and cons. You want to control the intracranial disease, but you also want to weigh that up against the risks of side effects, in particular radionecrosis. There's a lot of evidence to say that the more of the brain volume that's treated, the higher the risks of radionecrosis, which can also cause symptoms. So 20 cc has been generally accepted in the evidence as a reasonable upper limit for the cutoff of treatment. In practicality, that, you know, is a larger brain met around three centimetres in size, or it's a combination of smaller brain metastases. 
Um, and that's where the, the total number, you know, kind of comes from. How many should we treat? And quite frequently, 10 is quite a clinic, um, is a cutoff we tend to use clinically. So we don't tend to treat more than 10 metastases in total. Sometimes we might go up to 15, but again, that comes back to what cancer do they have? What's the prognosis and who is the patient? If somebody is a young, fit breast cancer patient with HER2 positive disease, you might push it and go up to 15. But if you've got somebody with lung cancer who has got rapidly progressing disease elsewhere, who's been two, through two or three lines of treatment, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be treating that number of metastases. Um, there is variation between clinicians. There is variation between centres, but that, that's generally what's accepted. You all know this referral pathway, I hope, um, but patients are discussed at Neuro College MDT, which runs from about nine, often till about 3.30 on a Tuesday. So you can imagine they can sometimes discuss 80 to 100 patients. So there's very much decision fatigue by 3 p.m. when we re reach the metastases section. So if that available information is not readily available, that discussion is not adequate at that time point, if that makes sense. The more information, I can't stress that enough, the more information we have, the better it is. Um, ideally, we see the patients in the SRS clinic on the Friday. We do scans on the Friday and the Monday, which include a CT scan, a mask, and an MRI. And then we start treatment um, the following week. And referrals are now made by a patient pass, which hopefully you will know. I'm only briefly going to touch on steroids because I think it's kind of outside the scope of today, um, but they should really be titrated with symptoms. So the ideal dose is the lowest dose that controls the symptoms and reduces the side effects, you know, as much as possible and the risks of steroids. You should decrease, you know, in a stepwise fashion. And please make sure if you're discharging a patient on steroids, there is a plan as to who's going to look after that in the future. Counsel them to say that if it's not, if your symptoms worsen, you need to go back up to the last dose that controlled your symptoms. Um, and then, yeah, just make sure they have follow-up as well. So, challenges in the pathway across Greater Manchester. I want to highlight, this is from a neuro-oncology MDT perspective. So, I know there's challenges from your perspective as well. And it's designed to kind of talk about, open a dialogue and see what your issues are, but also explain to you what the issues are sometimes from our perspective. So, an exam, first example case is a 74-year-old male admitted with headaches and word-finding difficulties. A CT scan at the beginning of March showed a left temporal lesion. Next steps. Hopefully, if you've learned anything by now, <laughs> it's a CT scan and an MRI scan with contrast. So you can see here um, that there is right upper lobe collapse because of a right upper lobe lesion, um, which has extended into the right main bronchus. There is also, um, on the MRI scan, you can see quite clearly a large lesion in the left occipital lobe, and there's also a um, left temporal lobe and a small, smaller second lesion in the left occipital cortex. So this patient was discussed at MDT, immediately referred, immediately discussed, and the plan was very much to resect the larger lesion because of concerns regarding mass effect and SRS to the second smaller lesion, listed for surgery the following week. But patient was then actually discussed in the lung MDT. So they went to the lung MDT after the neuro MDT. The right upper lobe tumour, they couldn't resect. They planned for palliative chemotherapy and they booked an EBUS. So they didn't have histological diagnosis at the time point of referral. That came back as small cell. So luckily this patient, well not luckily, but the, the, the surgery had been cancelled. There was multiple conversations between multiple professionals and three hospitals, Christie Salford and the peripheral hospital as to this patient, which took hours out of multiple people's time. First of all, you know, small cell carcinoma, chemotherapy is the appropriate treatment option. If he'd had surgery, that would have delayed the start of chemotherapy and caused harm. Um, needless to say, there was a lot of clinician input into this one patient. And also the patient didn't know what was going on. It caused massive confusion. So Ideally, the take-home message is, ideally, you need to have histology and a plan from the primary oncology team as to what you're going to do before you refer to neuro-oncology MDT. Case two, 71-year-old male admitted following a seizure and referred to neuro-oncology MDT in the beginning of March. All that was on the past medical history was several lesions removed from a face. Outside of the area, there's no histology at that time point. An MRI scan of the brain showed five lesions suspicious for metastases, but there's no other information on performance status, past medical history, clinical condition, patient knowledge, and they'd been discharged home. Rediscussed a week later, again with no further updates on patient pass. Rediscussed the following week, but unfortunately at this time point, he had been readmitted to hospital with confusion and worsening GCS. Now, in this case, you can see from the scans, he'd got rapidly progressive um, 
brain metastases. I need bled into some of these brain metastases. But I think, again, it highlights not enough clinical information on the referral. It highlights there's actually no plan for discharge. This patient's gone home, and they went home on a three-day reducing dose of steroids. So although he had rapidly progressive disease, and that might very well have happened anyway, he might have been readmitted, the lack of steroids won't have helped his symptoms. So I think that's the key point there, is consider who's responsible for that steroid regime on discharge. Example three, 85-year-old male, performance status one, admission with facial weakness, actually back in March, and the CT scan showed a left basal ganglia hemorrhage. He was on the stroke ward. He complained of weight loss. So they did actually do a CT scan to say, is there an underlying malignancy? And that was all negative. There was no sight of primary disease. A repeat scan as an outpatient six weeks later showed a new lesion in the right frontal lobe. And so at that point, he had an MRI scan with contrast, and that showed four lesions consistent with metastases. Next steps. He got referred again, straight to the neuro-oncology MDT. So, unfortunately, he's discussed quite recently on two occasions, on the 30th of Mar um, May and the 6th this week, but we don't have any further investigations. We don't have a histology. We don't have a primary diagnosis. We don't really know his performance status at 85, his comorbidities. He has been discharged home on steroids, and the MDT coordinator has you know, contacted the patient directly and he seems reasonably good, no past, you know, no past medical history, good performance status. But the outcome is, again, these lesions are technically amenable to SRS, but is that appropriate to do in an 85-year-old gentleman? The, you know, the outcome was we should have a PET CT, ideally to look for another site of disease to biopsy, because although you could do a brain biopsy, you know, it's a very, very invasive procedure. It should be done as a last resort. And is that appropriate in an 85-year-old patient? We now are stuck in a situation where we don't have a primary team to organise and act on these investigations. Don't know what the patient wants. We, we haven't solved this one yet, by the way. <laughs> yeah. um, so we need to establish a responsibility for the patient care on discharge, and I think that's a really key point as well. So quickly, take-home messages. Brain metastases are common. Incidence is rising. For good performance status patients with controllable extracranial disease, aggressive management can be considered um, of their intracranial disease, but only refer to neuro-oncology MDT if it's appropriate, if the good performance status, prognosis over six months, and the systemic disease elsewhere is controllable. For poor performance status patients with no further systemic treatment options, if they're not suitable for systemic treatment options, we're not going to do anything with the brain. So there's no point in referring to a neuro-oncology because you're asking for a treatment-related decision often in those situations. We can do SRS if the total brain mass volume is below 20 cc. There's limited mass effect and usually no more than 10 to 15 metastases. And surgery can be considered if you've got larger brain metastases, mass, ma mass effect or risk of hydrocephalus. Cephalus. So... This is the new brain metastases team with some beautiful faces I like to think on here. So um, there's me, there's Chantal. Chantal, I don't know if you want to wave at the back, but she's a brain metastases specialist nurse recently employed at Salford. There's me and Jenny, obviously Catherine and Ravel. Keen to establish any dialogue and listen to the problems that you guys have with us as well. Um, and just to plug a couple of future events, um, we're looking to do a, a webinar on steroid management specifically in September and a brain metastases study day in October. So it'd be great to kind of cover these topics in more detail and see you on that day. Um, and that's that. Thank you. <laughs> Claire, thank you very much for that. And thank you for showing a 20-year-old photograph of me. I like that. <laughs> um, thank you so much for... Uh, so, I'm, first of all, I'm sorry I'm late. I'm Catherine McBain. I'm one of the clinical oncologists at the Christie, and I'm the Greater Manchester Cancer uh, Brain and CNS Pathway Board lead. Um, so, thank you, Claire, for that. That was really comprehensive and, and rode my two favourite hobby horses, MR scan with contrast. The number of brain mets that are completely invisible on a scan unless it is an MR with contrast is immense. A CT scan will show you really big stuff, but you need the MR with contrast and think about the whole patient, think about the whole human being in terms of how they are. So thank you for all of that, that's brilliant. So I think what we do now is we move straight on to Lindsay to come and talk to us about rehab and, and those aspects. And then we'll hopefully, like you said, open a, a, a conversation because this isn't just about us talking to you. We really very, very much want a two-way conversation out of today. So, Lindsay. Hi. So I've been asked to come today to speak about um, rehabilitation for uh, brain and spinal tumour patients and it's just to explain what my role is and my colleague Sarah Robson who can't be here today. 
What am I doing? There we go. So Sarah and I um, are specialist AHPs for the Neuro-Oncology Service and we look after patients across Greater Manchester. So Sarah um, and her colleague Julie Emerson started this service about 11, 12 years ago. Um, and Sarah is an occupational therapist and I'm a physiotherapist. So some people that might know me, I used to work at Salford Royal in neurosurgery. So I'm very much enjoying my time at the Christie's over the last 18 months. So our role as specialist AHPs for the Neuro Oncology Service, we look after patients that come through Salford and then through their pathway as well to the Christie's. So we're commissioned by Greater Manchester Cancer and look after the patients through those services, but we also look after all the patients across Greater Manchester, but that also extends into Cheshire, into sometimes into Cumbria as well. So our patch is quite big and there's just two of us. So we, this is our area and we also look after High Peak and then into Staffordshire as well because our patients that come to Salford might be on more specialist pathways. And our main roles as specialist AHPs are, of course, patient care and support. But we also support and educate the clinicians and the professionals across Greater Manchester. So we support the therapists in each um, locality. We support clinicians that work in um, the hospitals. Um, and we support clinicians both across community neuro and palliative care. We're very much involved in best practice pathways. We are on a number of different boards and Sarah's worked on the recent NICE guidelines to support our support rehabilitation for this um, patient group. We specifically work with the local commissioning teams and obviously that's going through lots of changes at the minute, but we, we try and highlight the needs and the unique needs of brain tumor patients that require rehabilitation throughout their pathway. And it changes throughout their pathway. What they need right at the beginning may not be what they need during treatment and then what they ne might not need later on. And that's different to how commission services are made for neurological patients. So what do we do on a more day-to-day -day basis? So Sarah and I both sit in that neuro-oncology MDT with our colleagues on a very long period of time on a Tuesday. And in that time, we are looking for patients that have got rehab needs or patients that have got scans that may indicate they're going to have rehab needs or it might be people are coming back reoccurrence of tumour and we already know them and then we know they're going to have additional needs throughout their pathway. So we're there to coordinate their re rehab needs across Greater Manchester. We also take part in a best supportive care MDT, which is every two weeks. And that's where we take it away from the medical model slightly and really look at the holistic care needs of the patients. Some of the patients are our new high grade primary brain tumours. Others might be that we're working with on our case that we need to bring to that MDT to really talk about their holistic needs. And we have psychology within that. We have our specialist nurses from Salford, from Christie, and we just try and coordinate all their needs. We, we spend a lot of time supporting and advising and signposting um, patients and referrals from our oncology clinic. So we'll see patients in our follow-up chemo clinics on a Wednesday. We'll see patients in the new patient clinics at Christie. And we're there to pick up any of their rehab needs that may have changed going through treatment. Um, we, we can provide a little bit of treatment um, depending on how, how simple it is, but often we'll provide some and then we will find what else they need. And sometimes that's in NHS services, sometimes that's private, sometimes we'll guide people to charities, we'll just try and find exactly what will suit their care needs. We do spend a lot of time supporting patients and family. We support our CNSs with their patients that have got rehab needs, but we'll also key work some patients that have got a high rehab need as well. 
we do spend quite a bit of time supporting the teams in the Greater Manchester, like DGH hospitals, supporting complex discharge. Often the therapist looking after patients with a primary brain tumour will have never come across somebody like that before and don't know necessarily the nuances around looking after them and supporting their needs in the community. So we're there to help them with that as well. We sometimes visit them, but sometimes we'll just do that remotely. We spend a lot of time helping the community teams, the community therapy teams and the community palliative care teams, triaging referrals or supporting with them information from CWP about prognosis or what to expect or steroid or, or um, anti-epileptic medicine. We'll support them through that so to uh, prevent patient submissions. We do spend a lot of time providing education, supervision for clinicians. The, the way therapy works in Greater Manchester, you have um, each area tends to have a neurotherapy team in the community and a palliative care team. And they may not necessarily have crossing over skill mixes. So we support the community therapy team, understanding oncology and um, when to transfer somebody across to palliative care. But we'll also support palliative care team in managing complex neurotherapy issues too. Always, Sarah and I are always bang on about is rehab access. We want our patients to be able to access rehab at the right time in the right place for them. And that might not be at the right at the beginning of their journey. With a patient with a stroke, they tend to need a high impact of therapy really early on. And that isn't necessarily what our brain tumour patients need. So we try and tailor it for their needs, but we're also trying to make sure that our brain tumour patients, if they need specific neurotherapy, that they can access it. So that's kind of why our job. So this is a bit of a complicated um, pathway. I won't go through it too long, but basically our patients, and you know this because Claire's gone through quite a bit of it, but our patients go through a complex pathway and me and Sarah are there at the MDT. We're there when they come out of surgery and we're supporting them as they, supporting the referrals going to the community teams. We support the community teams with their referrals. If they don't have surgery, we'll also be knowing about the patient as they go into the local locality teams. We'll see them if they are leaving Salford and going to residential homes. So we'll know about them. We may not see them personally, but we'll know about them and we'll support the teams looking after them. And then we're also there if, if there's any issues during their radiotherapy and chemotherapy and we can support um, the therapists that are looking after them as they go into palliative care or towards end of life. As I mentioned briefly, Sarah um, Robson spent some time supporting the updated NICE guidelines for brain tumour and brain metastases. So they um, developed more recently some quality standards. And the one that we really love is finally being able to have a quality standard that says that adults with brain tumour should be able to access neurological rehab at any stage of their care. So pre prior to that, there was often um, barriers to allow brain tumour patients, particularly the higher grade patients, so the grade three and four tumours, to access neuro rehab, to access neurotherapy in the community. And when a patient has got a hemiplegic painful shoulder or some spasticity or some complex needs of therapy, then it's the neurotherapist that can support that better. So what does that mean? How do we treat these types of patients? So it is a combination approach. It's this combination of oncology and palliative care, the therapists that have trained in oncology, but then also the, the, the neuro rehab skills. And so we try and support the teams to be able to access some of those skills, show them what's transferable and then help them fill the gaps in knowledge. Do we need to know what a patient's rehab goals are to make them achievable? So I think we support the, the, the therapists in knowing what is an um, appropriate rehab goal and we help manage patients' expectations and hopefully find a place in the middle where both the therapists and the patients are getting what they want out of that rehab journey. So we have some challenges as Claire said as well. So the challenges with this group of patients is that they don't always present in the same way. So you might have a, you might have seen a brain tumour patient a couple of months ago, but they present completely different. And as much as that's a challenge for 
the clinicians here, it's also a challenge for all the therapists in the community as well, because they feel that they lack confidence in knowing well, what, what does that mean? What does, what does that mean? What should I do? What we don't know always is the histology, and that also makes the therapy team in the community really worry about what they should be doing with the patients. Um, not knowing prognosis, a lot of the therapists do worry the, what to do with the patient if they don't know the prognosis. So we support them with that, but also we look about what is it that the patient really wants to achieve, and that's what's most important. Um, we help support understanding and management of the patient's expectations around all the effects of treatment. So there's a misconception that you can't have therapy whilst you're having radiotherapy or chemotherapy, and that's not the case in our brain tumour patients. Actually, keeping active and moving is going to be really positive. Some other challenges, it's difficult to see the patient at that point because they might be in every day for radiotherapy. Um, but we can guide the therapy teams across GM that actually they might not be seen for six weeks. Let's start their therapy later on. And we also help them understand that as a patient's journey of reducing steroids, potentially straight out of Salford Royal, that some of their symptoms may come back. And that's a communication that we want them to have with our team to support that. It's challenging to work for these patients in the fact that this, it causes quite a lot of psychological changes and can impact the whole family and that whole social network. So we're part of that support system with our CNSs, with our team at Christie and at Salford to support them through that journey. And it also rehab might not be the patient's priority at this time. We have to really think about that might be what I want as a therapist, but it might not be what the patient wants. So it's really important to really dig deep and find out what is it that they want. They might get a little bit better faster in this environment, but they don't want that. So let me find a way that we can have what they need at home. That didn't, that's gone off. <laughs> Sorry. Huh? Chop down in my prime. Let me ask you a question. Oh, oh it's on. coming back on. Oh, very quickly. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm being really quick. So I just wanted to put a few resources on there that you can take away and have these slides. So um, these are some of the charities that we use. So that's really great if you need to direct some of your patients to that. Um, they're also really good resources for you as clinicians to look at. Um, there's a couple more things on there, I won't stay on it. And then I want you to just bring your attention to the Tessa Gel Academy, which is a um, resource that we use a lot. Um, it's quite new and it's got lots of amazing CPD opportunities for clinicians to learn about um, brain tumours, neurosurgery, radiotherapy, therapies. There's loads of information on there. It's a good networking opportunity too. And very quickly, our referral criteria is that we take adults with primary brain and spinal tumours. We don't see the metastatic patients, although if you have got if rehab issues around that, we, we will support. Um, we mainly get our referrals from the Salford therapist, but we take them from anywhere, that's not a problem. And we spend a lot of time triaging and we're here to provide guidance, prognosis, treatment effects and holistic care needs. And that's how you contact us. So hopefully you'll get this information through. And that's it, sorry, about that little hiccup in the middle. Thank you very much, Lindsay. So Lindsay and Sarah do amazing work trying to get the best out of the system, trying to make sure that patients are accurately assessed and, and that you know we're sort of pointing them in the right direction in the community. So in the interest of time, what I'm going to suggest we do is that we move straight on to the metastatic spinal cord compression section. Um, but then after that, we've got the panel and audience discussion. So we've got a specific amount of time for that. Claire is going to come up and join us. Obviously, Claire, I haven't seen you for a little while. Um, so Claire Greenbaum, uh, advanced nurse practitioner, is going to come and talk. Um, You'll find, I think, a fair bit of commonality between what Claire was saying about the brain mets and what Claire's about to say about spinal cord compression, about controlled disease. I'm not going to steal your thunder, but, you know, there's quite a lot of commonality here. And so it's great to have these sessions together and then we'll do the panel discussion uh, at the end. But write down your questions because uh, we, we do want to keep talking. Claire. Thank you. Right, then, we'll go on. Oh, there we go. So, um, hello everybody, I'm Claire Greenbaum uh, and I'm an ACP in Radiotherapy or Wars and I've just moved to a practice educator lead role with GM Cancer. Uh, can people hear you? Sorry, oh, can you stand oh, a bit closer? Sorry. Stand a bit closer. 
Oh, hello? I'm so used to doing teams these days. That I... <laughs> yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> No, that's great. So, um, yeah, so I've just moved to a practice educator role uh, with GM Cancer, um, and that's over a pilot site at Bolton. So, hello to Claire over there. And then today I'm going to talk about the successes um, and pitfalls of the Greater Manchester uh, Spinal Cord Compression Service. Okay, so um, just a little overview of the MSCC. Uh, so, acute oncology emergency, it presents in patients with a known history of cancer, prostate, which are you usually in prostate, breast, kidney, lung and myeloma, um, and sometimes in 20% of patients, which has probably gone up um, since COVID, um, MSCC can be their first presentation of malignancy. And what patients commonly present with is severe spinal pain and more later symptoms can include limb weakness, sensory changes and altered bowel and bladder function. Obviously, this needs prompt treatment, and otherwise it can result in paralysis and poor prognosis. Um, treatment options can include steroids, surgery and or radiotherapy, sacked or no treatment if the patient isn't well enough. Okay, so the aims of the treatment are to control pain, preserve neurology, and, um, and this is in order to maintain functional status and improve quality of life. Okay, um, I am going to go quite th quickly through these slides because I'm aware we are running behind. Okay, so um, decisions about treatment need to be made within days, and discussions will include fitness, fitness to proceed with treatment, overall prognosis, and whether um, further cancer treatments are available, other comorbidities, and there's lots of other things. But just as Claire mentioned in the brain um, Met's presentation, this is really essential at the point of referral. Okay, because this is what we make the decisions on, and they can be very different for each patient that comes along. Okay, so due to these multiple factors um, in this decision making process um, for the management and treatment, it can be challenging for all the reasons that have said, been said today and it requires an MDT discussion um, due to these complexities. Um, but it is essential for this patient group to have continuity and highly specialist advice in the area of MSCC to ensure high quality patient care. Okay, so national, I keep thinking this has got a light on it, I keep pointing. Um, so a national picture. Um, so at the moment, um, our guidelines are based on the NICE guideline, which was developed way back in 2008, okay? And obviously the landscape has changed, okay? So the key areas included service configuration, urgency of treatment, the experience for the patient themselves, what information they should be given, early detection, what imaging mo modalities we should use, and um, how we should treat spinal metastases and MSCC and this is in the form of surgery, radiotherapy and SAC treatment but as people will know uh, and also supportive care and rehabilitation but as most people know these can be a little bit vague at times these guidelines and there wasn't much meat in them. So just an overview of what happens nationally and these are some examples on how different it is wherever in other places in the country obviously in greater manchester it's the oncology services that lead the mscc um, services and advice in merseyside and cheshire again it's oncology uh, lancashire they're really lucky they have oncology and uh, surgery all on one site and in london it's actually neurosurgery who take the lead with mscc so there's a very different picture across the country Okay, so this is the team, okay? This is an old picture um, because there is a new addition to the team who is sitting in the room today. Um, so the team was established in 2013 by Lena Richards and she was a physiotherapist at the Christie and she recognised that patients... Um, weren't getting their needs weren't being met and um, she recognised that we weren't meeting nice guidelines. So this was when the service originated. Vivek Misra, one of the consultant um, oncologists, he then joined the service and then a specialist radiographer which is now Claire Shanahan and as I said Sarah Tiller has also just uh, joined the service recently. Originally it was under the hotline services and then we moved to um, network services under radiotherapy and this is a Christie led um, and funded service. Okay, so the aims and functions and responsibility of the, the service are we will support patients who have a su suspicion of and confirmed MSCC with timely care across the Greater Manchester Alliance. They develop and update clinical management pathways across the Alliance and we take referrals from primary, secondary and tertiary care for patients who have a known cancer diagnosis and who, pre uh, and who present with MSCC as their first presentation. Okay, And we aim to treat where possible within 24 hours uh, before further deterioration. 
The service also provides education and specialist advice across the Alliance. And we also have a subgroup that meets every six months. And there are some members of that subgroup who are in the room today. Okay, And that includes radiologists, surgeons, oncologists, palliative care teams, supportive care teams, um, acute oncology nurses, of course, um, everyone. Okay, So um, we all come together every six months. However, this is a huge area, okay? And this just reflects how many teams are involved in this patient process, okay? And sometimes you can need lots of these teams to come together in order to make a decision about a patient in a very short space of time. So again, just emphasising that fact that when we refer, we need all the right information in order to make a decision. But it's huge. Um, so although it might be a few patients... Each referral takes a lot of time and a lot of investigation in order to get the right answer at the right time. Okay. So the service covers a seven day service, Monday to Friday, nine till five is when you'll hear from the MSCC coordinator. And then out of hours, it's the hotline for advice and the on-call clinical oncologist trainee who will give specialist advice and take referrals. Overall responsibility, we have a consultant um, clinical oncologist on call seven days a week who takes that responsibility. So, summer of 2020, as we've all heard today, people are surviving longer, more treatment options, and the MSCC role, the scope had grown um, in an unplanned manner, and that was often in response, sometimes to COVID, sometimes to other things, but pressures on trainees as well, where People um, had extended roles and they'd looked at what was needed at the time in order to develop the service. However, as in what will, most people will find today is that services expand, people want to take on new things, but unfortunately the funding doesn't come along with it, okay? And that has to be thought about continuously along the line. So service expectations had increased. We'd had a change in management. As I said, the impact of COVID was unknown at this point. However, we were still meeting the guidelines. So a lot of higher tier management said, well, it's great. We're meeting the guidelines. We don't need to change anything at the moment. But then, as everyone will um, understand, sickness and crisis hits a small team. OK, so where do I fit in? So, as you know, I don't work for the team at the moment, but... Um, I received a call from Adrian Flynn, who was the head of radial therapy at the time, and said, I need some help. <laughs> He'd adopted a service, and um, I was working in ACP, as an ACP in radial therapy at Christie at Salford. And I was doing a lot of work with um, Dr McGee, who's now retired, and uh, Claire Arthur, because what we were finding was that a lot, a number of patients who'd been referred to the service were being transferred to Salford for surgery, but actually when they arrived at Salford, they were unable to have surgery. So what we then had was a number of patient who, patients who needed radiotherapy who were on Salford site, but then, as most people will know in this room, we then had a problem with clinical oncology cover Monday to Friday, and we couldn't deliver the radiotherapy at that site. But why would we want to take a patient to Withington just for the day when we've got two great machines at Salford? So that's when I developed the ACP pathway, where I would um, see the patient once a clinical decision had been made by the consultant on call that they needed radiotherapy. I would then assess the patient, make sure they were fit to proceed, consent, more importantly, explain the decision-making process on why the situation had changed from surgery to radiotherapy and made sure they knew what the follow-up plan was and how we were going to move that patient forward with mobility. And I was really lucky because we were at Salford, we had a really good um, physiotherapy and rehab team, okay? So that was that. The other thing was, I'd worked in, over 25 years, I'd worked in every part of this patient pathway. I was an ACP in neurosurgery. Um, I was a community Macmillan nurse. Um, I was uh, ACP lead over uh, gold standard frameworks in GP. And it was really good to have someone with an overview of community and acute work and on how this would work. So I offered a support with two days a week um, and subsequently, because of the things that I found in this service, I then went on to apply and, and was appointed to the NICE Guideline Update Committee for MSCCs. Um, that's been going on for the last two years um, because what I found, I felt couldn't be just this area. It must have been nationally with no national groups. 
So, and then the last thing, with all this going on, people think you have loads of time to do this sort of thing. I was doing a PhD at the time and I still am and hopefully I'm in my last year because I want the patient's voice to be heard of this group. And it's a qualitative study looking at the experience of MSCC patients who present with malignancy of unknown origin. So that's current. Um, so that's that. So at first, I was very much Tinkerbell when I joined um, on my two days a week. I got the list down, um, took the phone calls, spoke to many people in this room coordinating patients, which was really nice to see people today. But then I started some opening some kind of worms and the worms just kept coming. <laughs> And um, and then very quickly I turned into Cruella um, because we needed some change. And the reason people don't like change, and um, but sometimes it's not about letting patients down. It's not like about letting your colleagues down. It's just about going back to basics and looking at actually what a service was set up for and what realistically can we deliver, and incorporating other things which has come on since two thousand and eight, like the. Um, acute oncology services across the region you know in 2008 they were few and far between really they weren't really established whereas now you're really impart important factors in this process okay so just a bit about what I've said now MSCC team it was really difficult to knew, know where they sat and um, no one really knows how it works because there's so many components to it you've really got to embed yourself in order to understand how the process works um, on call teams were coming on at the Christie didn't know couldn't see the wood for the trees their job roles were increasing but it was a really important training factor for the trainees which we we couldn't you know um, take that away from them um, and then, as I said, so many people involved, multiple electronic, uh, electronic systems, you had patient spinal pass, you had uh, CWP, you had Sunrise, and then somehow it was like bringing all this information and then relaying it to the patient so they got the right information, really. So, um, and again, services had evolved without clear boundaries. So, did a review, participant observer model from November to March, and basically, as I said, it was just to um, establish a baseline current compliance, what additional resources we need immediately or for the future growth of the service. And more importantly, whether we met the patient's needs and um, the clinical partners across the alliance. OK, so these are what we assessed again. So nice guidelines, impact of demand, patient selection for all of the pathway, role definitions, nursing, rehabilitation, support of care, education and the infrastructure, uh, sorry, infrastructure of both staffing and non-staffing resources, which everyone forgets the admin support when it comes to developing a service, which the MSCC team don't have. So what we found as, as we expected, most of the things we met um, the NICE guideline on, which is great, Things that needed additional work on was communicating risk to what they considered in 2008 were high risk patients like your breast, your prostate. We weren't given information that primary teams weren't given information about that for what to um, look for early for patients. Access to specialist rehab and transition to care homes. Now this is a big can of worms that was opened and um, I'll come on to that in a minute. And the technical factors in surgical planning, I left that to the spinal surgeons and said, please, I'll let you take that forward. Now, activity for the service, um, not going to go through everything, but as you can see, from 2019 to 2020, there wasn't an awful lot of change in the numbers of confirmed, okay? But the key numbers that I want you to focus on now is how many no MSC patients we had um, in the service. So in 2019, we had 251 who were taken as referrals, but didn't actually have metastatic spinal cord compression or impending and it rose to 318 in 2020 as we say as we can see definitive outcomes there um, most people went for radiotherapy so this was again coming back to referrals where problems started and it's a bit of a theme for today so they were taken by phone um, and at the time Whatever came through was taken as a referral rather than just advice given. So what we found was um, a lack of clarity of who was taking responsibility for the patient at the time. So what people would start the referral and then the patient would progress, but 
there was sometimes they've not even had a scan at that point. So you can't make decisions without a scan. So that was one of the big things that had to change first, really, was that we had to split the referral system up into advice. And it was very clear that it turned into a, refer a referral once we had a confirmed diagnosis of MSCC or impending with a neurological deficit um, or it was due to unknown uh, malignancy. Okay, And that's where, um, because there was a lack of clarity around the suspected, who managed the suspected ones. Because literally, and to be fair, there were some junior doctors who and other medical professionals who just literally wanted to just hand it over and, oh, you deal with this. <laughs> it's just like, not yet, we don't. <laughs> but for them, they had 20 other jobs to sort out as well, okay? So... June 21, as you all know in this room, because this significantly impacted on local acute oncology services, is we went back to basics. And radiology confirmed MSCCs were taken as for referrals and impendings, as I've just said, with a neurological deficit or malignancy of unknown origin. And anyone else, it was advice only, and the referring team were to take responsibility. But as you know in this room, I suspect you picked some of this up as well. Okay? So... As I said, and as Claire said earlier, if the referral isn't right, it affects the clinical decision making, okay? And it takes longer, which is not the right thing for the patient, okay? And there was a lot of effort because there's lots of phone calls trying to get hold of people. So how it impacted on partner services, acute oncology, um, well, obviously things have grown now and we've got some really good services in place, but at that time, with COVID, people were being redeployed and it was a bit sporadic across the region, okay? And of course, trusts do other things other than cancer, okay? And we've got to remember that. So nursing-wise, um, and this is a particular problem with the bowel and bladder um, management post-MSCC, there was no sort of regional standards from a nursing perspective on how we manage these patients um, post-treatment. Um, and that's still ongoing at the moment. So support and rehab and we're going to get some um, from Rebecca Twigden next, but this was a this was a black hole essentially. That once they've had the treatment, who takes responsibility for these patients from a functional perspective? And um, what we've seen over the last few years is that trauma services have migrated to well have centralised to places like Salford MRI, and in local hospitals, we just don't have the same experience which we had years ago, and particularly things like orthotics. I mean, at Macclesfield, I've just been, been out there, and we only have an orthotics person, uh, like, three half days a week, really. Um, so there was me and Anne trying to pull out a whole cupboard once, trying to look for an aspen collar. So I'll let Rebe Rebecca talk about that. Radiology was another problem. It was variable across the region around reporting. Not everyone used the Belinsky scale, which made it harder when people were referring patients and making those decisions. So, radiotherapy pathway, briefly, the come as a day case, they were always late. Um, and that was because referrals, again, not always the right information. And... Um, People have got to remember that when they come from radiotherapy, it's not just for the radiotherapy bit. They have to be seen, they have to be scanned, planned, and then delivered the treatment. It's an all-day process. And they have to be well enough to transfer over as well. So coordinators um, were often taking on other responsibilities, which had pulled them away from this coordination at time, which didn't help this process. So education is another wide thing. Um, a huge thing, which... Um, Essentially, because of service demands, people have had to pull away from that. And um, we need to explore different ways to deliver education across the many. And everyone has different needs in this pathway, OK? What people need at the beginning of MSCC with early diagnosis, they don't need at the rehabilita re re rehabilitation stage. So everyone has different needs. And particularly our generalist um, colleagues in practice, you know, it's about giving them the right skills to identify and manage patients after treatment because essentially they will be the people that people go to locals to home. So, and again, whose responsibility is to fund it? At the moment, it's a Christie, but it's a wider network that we need funding for. So audit and research, um, as all today, uh, treatment outcome data needs to be analysed, but we don't have time to do it. 
We have done some work with the lung team, which um, looked at patients from 2014 to 2020 who went for surgical decompression. And this highlighted the fact of early um, primary teams getting involved with the decision-making process and things like uh, genetic um, mutations and things like that can impact on what can um, be best outcomes for these patients when they go for surgery. So that was really interesting. Um, obviously, my PhD, um, however, this is all time consuming and challenging across a number of trusts. And I know that from having to go through ethics with my PhD. And the other thing is, what are the needs of specific disease groups like the lung group? All diseases behave differently. So we need some guidance on how to manage each patient directly. So MSCC team, it's proven itself. It's committed to delivering excellent care to patients. However, successful when compared to the aims of the service when it, when it was established 10 years ago. But 10 years is a long time and things have changed. Um, increased expectations to take um, responsibility of patients outside the core functions of the team. Um, and we recognised additional support was required and ongoing development. So these are all the recommendations, but I'm not going to go through them. If anyone wants to um, talk about them, we will. And summary... Obviously, new NICE guidance is out in 2020, September, and the big change is it will include spinal metastases, and that's because we want a more proactive approach, and we need more work with individual disease groups, we need to work with local trusts and acute oncology services, and earlier diagnosis, and take pressure off A&E, and whatever the prognosis is, we aim to be support, we want to support the person's own individual goals and preferences. We should see this as a, a transition in their oncology management and needs for holistic and personalised care to, for them to get the right person at the right time with the right knowledge and skills. And who knows where the service will belong in the future. But we need investment and the patient group needs to be heard. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you very much, Claire. So again, a, a Herculean task looking after all these patients with uh, with spinal cord compression. But thank you very much indeed for that. Again, as we said, we've got panel discussion time and I think it will all sort of hang together well because there's a lot of commonality here. So we're going to move straight on to uh, Rebecca and Rhiannon who are going to come and talk to us about um, rehab and spinal cord compression. Yes. Welcome. Ah, yes. Um, so, hi, good afternoon. Uh, so, my name is Rhiannon Sears and this is Rebecca Twigden. So, um, as our intro just said, we're two physiotherapists uh, for the Greater Manchester Spinal Cord Outreach Service uh, based at Salford. Uh, and today we're here to talk to you about MSCC and rehabilitation. So, it follows on quite nicely from the presentations you've just had. Um, there's a couple of things that are going to probably be repeated in our presentation. So, we'll skip past those slides just for time purposes as well. Um, so in terms of what we're going to speak to you about today, we're going to introduce you to the service that we are in. Uh, it's quite a new service and hopefully it will fill or plug some of the gaps that have been identified in some of the guidelines in terms of rehabilitation for this patient cohort. Uh, we're going to go through a bit of an MSCC overview, which is some of the slides that we'll probably skip through. Um, talk to you about the assessments that we complete with these patients, um, the therapy input we provide for them, the contraindications to that also, um, and then we'll talk to you a bit about the early identifications of the rehab pathway, which we currently do at the moment. So a little bit about the service that we work within. Um, so I've been in post probably about 18 months yourself, probably about a year-ish. Yeah about a year or so. So uh, this service um, came on the back of a big NHS uh, review in, back in 2016. So typical NHS, it takes a fair few years to get things going, uh, where they basically looked at spinal cord services across the country and they found that actually there's quite a big in inequality of care. Uh, what that basically meant was um, that they found that patients who get input from specialist teams who know how to manage spinal cord injury, um, obviously they get better outcomes generally, but the availability of these services across the country was lacking a little bit. So obviously a lot more patients are surviving spinal cord injuries, whether it be traumatic or you know um, oncology based, uh, but actually the services available for them aren't kind of keeping in line of the, you know, the ability to survive these injuries. So initially what they looked at doing is actually opening an additional spinal cord specialist rehab centre. So there's already a fair few that exist around the country. Our closest here in the northwest is um, Southport. But they found that that might just absorb the initial impact of these patients coming through. So it would only probably be a short win. But actually what they probably need to do is to look at a completely different model of care for these patients. And maybe actually start to have some of these specialists embedded at like your neurosciences centres and your trauma centres. 
So on the back of that, some funding was um, provided um, across the country for each region to basically upskill and embed some specialists to provide this rehabilitation um, input for the patient cohorts. So in the northwest, there was a bid put forward. So in terms of who won that money, it was split between Salford, Preston and the Walton Centre and a little bit of money went to Southport Spinal Injury Centre. Salford, because we generate the biggest amount of referrals um, and have quite a large cohort of spinal cord injury patients, we got the biggest pot of money. How we decided to spend that money is to actually develop a, um, some staff, which we'll go through our model shortly, uh, whereby we actually look after the spinal cord patients, not only at Salford, but around Greater Manchester as well. In our service, we decided to do things a little bit differently. Um, so the spec initially set out that it should only be patients who aren't oncology background, um, which we thought was a little bit unfair and we didn't agree with that. So we've decided to look at the MSCC patients as well. And we're the only service that actually does that in the country. So it makes us a little bit different. In terms of our service aims, we're a very, very um, you know, infant um, team. So but we've established that our aims are to enhance the experiences of patients who sit out the, uh, the Northwest Spinal Injury Centre, which is also known as Southport. What we look to focus on is the initial path, sorry, part of the patient pathway, uh, provision of clinical and educational support, provision of routine follow-up post-discharge to collect patients um, closer to home. And essentially, we're not looking to replace anything that Southport deliver for patients, but we're looking there to enhance that. What that means for MSCC patients is that we actually have an involvement with them, um, whereas at the moment, they, they didn't really have anything involved at all. So we're there to kind of be a bit of an advocate, really. So in terms of our staffing model, so the team that we're in, we have a, a spinal cord injury a rehabilitation consultant, Dr. Dahab. Speech and language therapist who is a part-time and she's mainly based upon critical care. Two physios, so myself and Bex. I'm full-time, Bex is part-time. Uh, we have an occupational therapist who's also part-time, a therapy assistant practitioner, uh, a psychologist and a, a spinal specialist nurse um, also in our team. So we're quite lucky. We've got a really good holistic MDT. In terms of our service vision, I'm not going to go through it in massive, massive detail, but as you can see, we're trying to be quite holistic and it's not only about us kind of clinically inputting to these patients, but we're also looking to upskill the, the um, clinicians who are involved in these patients' care. You know, there's only a small team of us and Greater Manchester is very big, so we need to be able to upskill and empower those, pa uh, those clinicians who are involved in the care. And obviously, as you can see there, quality improvement and research is something that we'll be looking to kind of really get involved in at a later stage. Uh, the pillars of our service, so again, I'm not going to go through each of the points, but we've decided to base it on the four pillars of like, advanced practitioner because we felt that it covers our service really well. We're looking, obviously, to involve ourselves in the research, as we've already said, clinical practice, leadership and education. So those are kind of what we're looking to really kind of base ourselves on. These really underpin our service. Thank you. So from rehabilitation, we're really passionate as an outreach team that these patients get the right rehabilitation, as would any other spinal cord injury patient. And Southport will not accept them on the basis that they're an MSCC. So there is a real gap in this service for rehabilitation. And we recognise this. And this is where we want um, to try and allow these patient voices to be heard and access to the right rehabilitation. I'm just going to flick through the next few slides because some of these are similar to what you've discussed. Um, so typically at Salford, a lot of the patients we see will have undergone fixation for surgery. Um, these patients, if they're a known cancer uh, with a prognosis of six to 12 months, single lesion and no METs in major organs. If the prognosis is more than 12 months, there's some spinal instability. They'll look at um, the standardised assessment tools to de determine if they're going to go through surgery. And also, if it's an unknown primary, then they can get a tissue diagnosis from the biopsy. Oh, sorry, I think I've done the same as before and knocked that off. Apologies. Um, so the aims of the surgery, just to summarise quickly, to the removal of bone tissue causing the neural compression. Um, it's, it's made clear to the patients it won't reverse the damage already caused, but will prevent further damage. Um, it, it involves pa basically placement of metal work for stability. And um, biopsies are routinely taken. Um, and those that with highly vascular spinal lesions, such as urinal um, primaries, they'll require embolisation prior to surgery. 
We do see, though, a handful of those that are on the conservative treatment pathway, those with aggressive systemic disease with a poorer prognosis, less than six months, those with multi-level involvement, established paraplegia, those not fit for general anaesthetic, those undergoing palliative radiotherapy, and these are the ones that may be requiring brace or pain management um, in order to still allow them to get them to move and get them out of bed and allow rehabilitation with, when, with what they're able to do. And I've just put a link to um, the Christie's guidelines here for mobilisation for these patients not undergoing surgery. And there's some real clear guidelines, then step-by-step -step approach of, of how to start mobilising these patients. And then just to quickly, the main role um, from physio with regards to MSCC. So um, involvement very early on as per NICE guidelines, we're assessing within the first 24 to 48 hours of seeing the patient. Um, we're looking at goal setting and again, really pertinent to the individual patient. Um, I think Lindsay mentioned this in her talk, but we may have ideas of what we think they should be aiming for goals. Sometimes it's really different for what the patients want. So very much listening to their views and looking at what we can aim to achieve realistically. Then involved in the um, treatment of the patients, their rehab, um, a big aspect looking at positioning and pressure care management, which we'll touch, touch on shortly, an educational road um, role, um, looking at emotional support for these patients. Again, it's just such a double whammy coming in with not only sometimes an unknown cancer um, diagnosis, but uh, and then knowing it's metastatic and then you're off your feet and you're changing your life lived as a spinal injury. So a huge amount of emotional support with these patients. And then early discharge planning and trying to access where we can get them through to rehabilitation. So as, as I've, I've said, specialist assessment within 24 to 48 hours allows us to just specifically identify any pain, motor, sensory dysfunction or bladder and bowel involvement. Um, for the stable spines, we can easily carry out full neuroassessment. For those that are unstable, we just refer to these which are taken from the GAIN guidelines um, regarding limitations of movement of what we can and can't do with these patients. I won't go through it in, de in detail, but that's just what we will refer to. So in terms of the uh, therapy assessments that do, some of you may be aware of something called the Asia Assessment or also known as the ISCOS Assessment, so International Spinal Cord Society. We don't necessarily do this with all MSCC patients because sometimes it's not necessarily that appropriate um, to, you know, to really highlight somebody's um, disability is not always appropriate you know, with a cancer diagnosis. So we choose quite wisely about the patients we do this with. But it just gives you a really good idea, certainly for those ones with really good prognosis and who are probably going to go through some sort of inpatient rehab, um, you know, what level of injury they've got it gives you obviously some sort of outcome measure to monitor for any deterioration and um, so if we don't feel like this is appropriate they'd at the very least be having a neurological assessment of some sort so we know what's going on um, you can get this just if you literally google asia spinal assessment if you want to look at it in more detail but it essentially it looks at obviously your myotomes and dermatomes and obviously it looks like rectal examinations as well so we can obviously look at um, with our spinal nurse from a bowel and a bladder um, input as well so in terms of therapy input, so even those patients who haven't got any neurological deficit, they get an assessment um, because, you know, sometimes we can really find quite subtle um, kind of imbalances. So they all have, a, as per the guidelines, a assessment. For those with neurological deficit, um, we obviously complete the assessment. And in terms of what we do, it depends on what we find. So there's no kind of blanket. Um, so we put, give therapy input as it's indicated. And obviously that supports our discharge planning. Um, they are probably likely to have a slightly more complex discharge needs, but again, that's patient to patient and obviously with the background of maybe if they've got steroids again things might improve you know we kind of deal with that as it comes along um, in terms of those patients with um, kind of what we identify as a T6 and above uh, deficits, then we obviously need to look at and consider the respiratory component of things, monitor for any deterioration uh, and so forth um, and then as I'll go to in a second... Yes. So in terms of muscle respiration, just a bit of a recap. So what we're looking at here, we're looking at being able to monitor that. Can they cough effectively? Can they clear their own secretions? Do they need an adjunct to support them with this? How aggressive do we need to be? What comorbidities do they have? So there's lots of things can take into consideration. Um, so we work quite closely with the, the medics to kind of have a look at that as well. And they need might need quite close monitoring as well. Are their oxygen requirements going up? Are their new scores going up? So these are all things that we need to consider as well. And also a lot of them might be on bed rest for a while. So we need to consider that as well. 
Um, in terms of the other things that we can do, so I, I spoke a little bit about these. So obviously, you've got like your basic stuff like your ACBT, incentive spirometer, birding them, um, and then obviously assisted cough, um, and then positioning, which is probably und underused quite a lot in physio, but positioning a patient obviously within the constraints of their bed rest um, is very important as well. Um, and as it says there at the bottom, anything prophylactic, we certainly need to be checking with the medics. We would do that even if it was like something where we were concerned about a chest infection. We'd always check, certainly if there's some instability there as well. So in terms of positioning for pressure care, so spinal cord injury patients, we know that they have um, their, their skin changes as one of the big factors from spinal cord injury. So they're at higher risk anyway. Alongside that, they, um, as we said, reduce mobility. They might be on bed rest, impaired blood supply to certain areas of their body. They might have impaired sensation, reduced muscle tone. They're at risk of moisture lesions, um, reduced awareness and understanding. You know, they're probably like, well, I've never had to think about, you know, my pressure areas before. What's all this new stuff that you're talking to me about? Um, and their nutrition might be a little bit poor. If you're on bed rest, you probably won't eat as much um, or Unfortunately, being in a hospital, your food isn't as probably nutritious as you probably have at home. Um, so there's lots of things to take into consideration. So common sites for pressure sores. So as you can see here, it's your typical ones, really. It's the, it's the positions when you're in bed that you think, oh, that's a bit uncomfortable, I'll move. Obviously, we're aware of that. These guys aren't aware of it. They might not even feel it as well. And some of these patients, because they're on bed rest and there's potentially some instability, they might be on a normal mattress. So actually, they're still at, they're at very high risk of it. So in terms of positioning, so utilising pillows, pillows are like absolute gold dust in, in hospitals, so we use them massively. So obviously making sure that their head is well supported, making sure that there's a pillow between the knees, all these pressure areas, liaising with the nursing staff and the support workers about regular positional changes, telling the patient to kind of, you know, ask for support in changing them, obviously within, within the constraints of their, um, you know, if they, if they had to be on kind of a log roll and so forth. So this is talking about more of a patient who maybe isn't under really strict um, kind of, you know, guidance to remain on flat bed rest. Um, so the only picture we could find here, but um, what would this would mainly be is if, imagine that person in the wheelchair is lay down, it's like a frog position. So it gives a really nice stretch as well um, to kind of the legs and the hips. So it's an, also another really nice position for these patients. I think one of the things that we differ with with these patients in regards to our other spinal injury patients is if any spinal injury patients get any pressure areas, then Southport have a really strict bed rest regime until the pressure is fully really, um, reduced so that there's no redness whatsoever. With this patient group, to spend four weeks on bed rest is you know, pretty awful if time is a limiting factor. So um, it's definitely an individual basis where we discuss as actually is the mental well-being and their, is that going to be out benefit them being on bed rest? So we just maybe look at um, shortened periods of sitting out, making sure the pressure sore is not getting worse. And just if they're able to, to give the capacity that they'd rather do that, even if it meant that getting worse, and then we, we you know, a little bit more um, leeway with these patients. Um, so just quickly carrying on from our therapy input, um, we've got a really good um, OT within our team who's very dynamic and very much into sort of optimised hand function and functional independence. Um, so wherever possible, we're trying to look at that with patients. Um, for those on bed rest, especially sort of bed exercises within, within the constraints, the limits, what's safe to do if there's any instability there. Um, a big aspect on positioning, uh, there's not a, a lot of evidence to support um, just doing passive range of movement. I know that's what phys people say, physio come and move the limbs, but the 24 hour positioning plan um, is what we kind of implement with these patients. And we... I think we touched on the importance of, of bladder and bowel. So we haven't got our specialist nurse with us today, but she gets involved very early on to making sure that they're on an established bladder and bowel regime. And this is really important for therapy so that they're comfortable knowing that they're not going to have accidents, which is just, you know, really humiliating for, humiliating for the patient. So we get that trying to establish as soon as possible. And then just a, a quick picture on different adaptive devices which patients may use to help functional independ independence. Um, range of movement's really important just to allow them to be as functionally independent as possible for their transfers, for function, gripping, sitting um, and, and transferring, yeah. So therapy input, seating, 
where, as soon as possible, where possible, but making sure we've got the right pressure relief, allowing for bed mobility, independence in pressure relieving themselves, um, transferring wherever pos possible, looking towards that independence, looking at balance, mobility, gait re-education, wherever possible, get an early wheelchair available for the patient because that's our main means to independence independence, getting off the ward, being able to go out with their own family in visiting time, um, and trying to get that wheelchair as timely as possible, and then exercises specific to the, to the patient. Just to mention those with lesions at T6, due to the disruption in the autonomic nervous system, they can become particularly hypotensive and bradycardic in the early days. So this sometimes takes a little bit of our therapy time in putting with these. Um, so mobilisation may require a really gradual approach. And with this, we might be looking at putting um, long lead TEDs on, abdominal binder to try and support the blood pressure. If that still isn't really effective, then we look at medications such as ephedrine to time in with when we're going wanting to get these patients out of bed. While we're sitting them up and starting to mobilise, we're looking at blood pressure and any changes in neurology just to monitor that carefully. And sometimes this can even take two to three weeks just to get a patient out of bed. It's not always the case, but there are some individuals where we just have to go really cautiously. And then just quickly, um, because we've talked about a lot of our patients will have spinal fixation, there are just some things to bear in mind which we may treat differently for other spinal injuries that haven't had metal work put in their back. So the main kind of advice is avoiding excessive bending, lifting, twisting, um, and then it's, it's kind of putting this into practice um, functionally. So one of the things we like to keep is 90 degrees at the hips. So with your typical sort of paraplegic type, pace, type patient, we might be looking at them reaching forward to get their uh, footwear socks on. We wouldn't be doing that forward flexion in some of our fixation, pa well, in all of our fixation patients. So we need to just modify activities there. And same for banana board transferring. Often we'll try and encourage a patient to really flex forward, to lift the bottom. But again, it's just modifying it. And even wheelchair skills, just making sure they're not too exuberant with those forward motions. So it's just um, being mindful of these things. Um, and then I think as Bex has already touched on, so one of the key things for us is really early identification for the rehab pathway for these patients. Now, sometimes we're a bit limited because we need a lot of information to be able to do certain referrals. But as we do with any patient, um, as soon as the patient comes in, you're already thinking, okay, where they're going to be, what do they need, where do they need to go? So as early as appropriate, you would have a conversation with the patient. You would obviously wait for a lot of the information um, and then <clears throat> do the referrals as necessary. So... These are generally the main ones that we have with this cohort of patients. So we do have some that do go to the hospice, some that do go to specialist neuro rehab. Usually that's based at Salford. Um, so we've got ward L1, ward C2, but we also do have the inpatient neuro rehab units. So such as Trafford, um, the Devonshire uh, and the Floyd unit also. Local intermediate care or a, a discharge to a cess bed. Um, and then they may just go home with community input, whether it be general community, palliative care or community neuro team. So those are generally the ones. It's not saying that's an exclusive, you know, that's all of them. But those are generally the ones that um, where our patients usually end up. In terms of how we make that decision. So every two weeks, so bi-weekly, we have a um, MSCC ward round for our team. So all of the MDT members that I spoke to you about are in that as well as our acute oncology nurses and um, we've been doing it now for a fair few months haven't we uh, we used to amalgamate it with the rest of our patients but what we were finding is that actually um, things move a little bit slower with these patients we're waiting for information um, it takes a little bit longer and um, so it's actually worth us speaking about these patients in a completely different ward round of their own right with our oncology nurses so these are all the people involved. Um, so it gives, gives us an idea to gain a background of the patient. So hopefully we would have probably met them already as some of the other MDT members, so we can really know what we're talking about, the presentation of the patient, the patient's wishes. Um, and as we say there, sometimes we are waiting on some information which is beyond our control as to how quickly we get those. So that's a bit frustrating, but the, 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 I think the beauty of our ward round is that actually by, I, I would probably, we, we do need to audit it. I think things have probably been a bit better and a bit moved a bit quicker along since we've been doing it. But obviously we will be ordering uh, auditing that so it's just um, kind of anecdotal evidence at the moment 
Um, as I said there, not all the information is always there to make that decision early on, but we're all have it, already having some sort of idea, um, you know, about what the patient might need. Um, and then as I, the, or the rehab pathway, is a, we're able to identify any issues that the patient might have. Do they have spasticity or tone that they need some medication for? Is there ongoing issues with their blood pressure? Do we need the rehab consultant to go and have a look at them? You know, so there's lots of different things that we can do there as well. And obviously the bowel and bladder, uh, which is a big one. So in terms of rehabilitation as per the NICE guidelines, um, so all patients should have access to therapy services for an assessment and rehabilitation. Patient goals should focus on independence and quality of life. That doesn't differ for any other patient. Transfers and mobility is key. It gives them that level of independence. And equipment provision, i.e. a wheelchair, is really, really key for these patients as well. Aims of rehab, as it is always, patient-centred, short-term realistic goals, looking at functional outcomes, and ideally, you know, we're looking at to achieve the best quality of life for each of these patients. Regular reassessments and any changes in their condition. Um, and even if the functional outcome is limited, quality and affirmation can be achieved by giving patients physical, social and emotional opportunities and a sense of control. These patients have lost all of that, so let's give them what we can in that ability too. And there's just some references to finish, so... Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, I said, don't go, don't go. You're sitting here. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I certainly learned loads there. There's loads in there I didn't know. A massive thank you from Greater Manchester Cancer if you're the only people in the country that are taking the malignant ones. So that's fantastic. So very mindful of time. We are running a bit late um, and I'm sure everybody will need teas and coffees again. And also we want to make sure that there's that you see the posters so that we, we judge the posters. But I think the plan is that we all sit Round here. So on the chairs, please, could we call Rebecca and Rhiannon, Claire and Claire, uh, Lindsay and Nicola Hopkins? Marvellous. Uh, and I don't know whether, so we've got a mic, so I'll come and sit over there. Just touch it there. Am I talking? Okay, wonderful. So um, we've had some fantastic uh, talks this afternoon, really wide ranging. And, and we said there's quite a lot of commonality across both the brain mets and the spinal cord compression. And one of the commonalities is this business of using patient pass to refer into the MDTs. So I'm going to start with a question to the room. You can all sort of chip in, but I'm going to ask the acute oncology uh, gathered here. What are your bugbears? What are your bugbears? What are the what are your big problems with brain mets and your big your big bugbears with the spinal cord compression? Because we've clearly got superbly committed individuals doing their level best for the patients and for staff colleagues, but we also know it's not that easy out there. So talk to us. Anne. across the trust um, across the organizations it's like I um, alluded to earlier so when patients are referred um, on the patient pass it's done in real time and you know they may come in with a very poor performance status they may have had a seizure and etc and they're referred and as you say you have like 80 90 sometimes patients for discussion and how you know you're reliant on the information given um, and you don't know if they've responded to steroids or not. We've had a few cases recently that they've probably said, oh, this patient's probably for best supportive care. We've got involved. We said, hey, this lady is no longer confused. She's walking, etc." And I think that's, we've had good discussions with the CNS uh, across the way. And um, just an, an, just one more thing, <laughs> sorry. It's about um, when we're trying to inform patients and about patient information. When patients are discharged from hospital on reducing dose of steroids, um, you know, there's an expectation that this might be, you know, there'll be an electronic discharge, go to the GP. You know, I've sometimes rang up a week later and that, di that electronic discharge has not been processed because of admin problems at that primary care setting. So, um, you know, we did speak to some of the, there was a, there was a, I think it was just the initial post-COVID, there was a, patients were just going home with like probably a week's worth and we should try you know please make sure that they at least have two weeks supply of steroids and although it is written on the EDNF and the um, boxes I think it would be 
well, I think this is something we can talk to our pharmacists about, is some patient information about, you know, like you said, if your symptoms worsen, increase, because I'm conscious of the fact that the palliative care services in East Cheshire and acute oncology, you know, we don't, over, we don't work over the weekend. That's just some ideas. So, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say there's a number of things. Yeah, yeah. it's steroids. So I think, yeah, so I, I think the difficulty sometimes it seems to us from our perspective at Neuro-Oncology MDT, very much what Claire was alluding to, it's a tick box exercise. It's, you know, a patient's presented with brain metastases. Somebody, it sometimes quite often is the most junior person on the ward with the least amount of information does that referral and it's tick, job done. The referral's done and it feels sometimes like the responsibility then becomes the Neuro-Oncology MDT. But it's an MDT and we can't take responsibility for a patient. So, and like I say, sometimes, although there's limited information on the initial referral, there's no reason why that patient pass referral cannot be updated with the patient changing condition, you know, over the course of the week before that Tuesday MDT meeting. So, like you say, although initially they come in with a certain presentation, that changes and therefore that information needs to be put on patient pass. So we have up to date information for, to enable the best possible discussion, definitely. Um, the second point is about steroids, and I know they're really difficult. They're difficult for everybody, if that makes sense, especially with limited information. And certainly that's something that we were looking at, at, at doing with the, the Cancer Academy, you know, looking at um, specifically a webinar, a didactic resource for, you know, specialists to look at what steroids to dose to start with, how to wean that safely. But also, like you say, actually, maybe we need to think about doing a patient information leaflet. And, and maybe that's something we could look at to say, when you're discharging a patient, here's your patient information leaflet. And you know, here's some appropriate numbers. Because um, if they're known to the Christie, sometimes that can be things like the hotline and specialist teams. But that, you know, that's a good point, And that's something that we can certainly look at picking up on. That's brilliant, Anne. Thank you. I think those are two really important points. In terms of the responsiveness of patient pass, although for the brain mets one, I want to compare and contrast the brain mets and the cord comp here. For the brain mets one, as Claire has said, although the patient pass referral is only looked at once a week, so for the neurosurgical referral, that's live. They will look at that because that's meant to be emergencies. For the brain mets going into the MDT, it's not looked at every day. It's only looked at once a week on the Tuesday. However, after that referral has gone in, you can go in. So if it's referred by the A&E officer, you, if you then see them three days later and they're not confused anymore, you can go in and put some additional information into that referral that we will then see. So you need access because you, do you not have it? Okay, so that's something that, the, that, the, that Jane and, and the network could help with isn't it? Because because you can you can absolutely have access. So that's something we need to pick up, isn't it? In terms of sort of, and so although that won't be seen till the Tuesday, you can actually go in to make that referral more complete. And it's particularly useful if someone is less bad than they were or things are clearer. What about live sort of, what about that sort of interplay with the, with the MSCC conversation where somebody comes in with not a lot of information and then it changes? So... Uh for the MSCC, um, so if they will phone the coordinator or it will be the um, registrar on call who takes that information for CWP. However, as we all know that these patients might go through three different channels and the surgical channel, um, they will need to be referred via spinal pass. Now, it is supposed to be by the, spy, uh, by the MSCC coordinator, but ultimately there are some, there are some times that the wards will refer the patients directly to spines, particularly if the patient doesn't have a known cancer diagnosis at the time of admission. And this is where it does get very grey and very complicated. And I think one of the outcomes of the service review was that actually we need to look, look at this in the longer term really, but it is looked at all the time by the spinal team. CWP obviously, um, the referrals on there for all patients will be looked at by the coordinator or the out of whoever's on for oncology. Um, so that's how we're looked at, but it is complicated um, because it's over so many systems. But we did have a problem with spinal pass because a lot of the oncology trainees um, and consultants don't ha didn't have access either. So we've had to work on um, giving the trainees access to spinal pass. So 
on a weekend and out of hours, they are all able to update the spinal system. Yeah, so it, I, yeah, there isn't a right answer. So I think there's definitely something there about that we can maybe pick up about that interaction with those systems that Salford are now using. Any other comments about the steroid point of view? Or, or other questions from back, behind you there, Anne? Thank you. Um, my question, my comment is not with regards to steroids, it's with regards to the presentation as a metastatic or compression for the malignancy of unknown origin. That is very difficult to manage from an acute oncology team point of view, because obviously these patients present with an emergency. And then obviously we talk that you guys rely on that. What is the prognosis? What is the outlook? And obviously we are, it feels on the ground that we're obviously always playing catch up with something that is just moving ahead of us. So from a DGH point of view, and certainly where I'm based, uh, getting that biopsy and getting that diagnosis, and then obviously getting that patient moving on the pathway, sometimes seems to be like a, you know, a, a major obstacle. So I guess that while, while you were talking, I was just thinking about whether there is you know, whether there could be a call for actually those patients that present with a malignancy of a non-origin as a metastatic spinal core um, presentation, whether there could be a very specialized pathway for those patients to have access to a ring first biopsy somewhere, whether it's sulfur or somewhere else. Because as I say, um, for us sometimes with the best will in the world and, and just talking to everyone, it just feels that that patient is not getting the treatment for that metastatic core compression because we are hitting multiple obstacles in, in the workup phase. So I do wonder whether as a network we should think a, a, a bit as to how we can facilitate that particular presentation. Yeah, and I think these are things that will probably need to be looked at in the future, but you're right. And, and I think as Claire alluded that we, we have to have all that information before we can make a decision. Um, but yeah, in, particularly in local hospitals, smaller hospitals, access to biopsies are particularly difficult, even more so after COVID. Um, so I definitely think that if you brought it up, um, it is a conversation to be had, um, but it needs bringing up at the right levels. Um, so yeah, um, and I'm sure everyone will agree who, who has problems accessing biopsy services for these patients. Sorry, Claire, I'll just really back important. you up on, on that. I think in part, it's not just it, in some es essence, there's been changes in MSCC that is how we manage certain um, kind of site specific diseases, like, for example, haematology and um, and actually um, new uh, prostate disease. The, the management of MSCCs are changing. So it's, it's also supporting us in DGHs to actually get simple things like tumor markers because a lot of those patients um we you know kind of when we get them put through to the lab we're waiting on information at our end and you know i'll give the like sarah and the girls at the msec coordinators because they're saying can you chase this can you chase this and we're sitting there going we are we're waiting on the information equally as much as yourselves but it's just kind of a centralized support of trying to prioritize those kind of tumor markers but in in essence sometimes as well what I was going to get at is is at the beginning is sometimes if the if the patients are come in as an unknown they they may go through an alternative route so they'll come in with symptoms of corda equina that they think is traumatic rather than metastatic um, and they go through to the the neurosurgeon side and it might even be from a brain mets perspective they'll go through a, a, a different route and oncology isn't always considered at that point and we get a slight delay in in those kind of in those inputs so sometimes what it can be is is that we'll get contacted days in going what do we do with the steroids we want to send this patient home this patient's fit to go home and it kind of goes on from what Anne said before is we want to go with the set with the specialist teams management and advice but it's not always as clear cut as saying you know cut the steroids down for this cut the steroids down for that because I know we have a set plan from the Christie from an MSCC perspective post management and post treatment but 
I think the I fully agree a patient information leaflet or even a professional information leaflet to say this is what we need to do from a step down point of view for these patients from a safety point of view as to what we do for both MSCC and um, kind of the brain met side. I think that's really powerful. I'm very, very, very mindful of time. Uh, I think maybe that leaves us, so we think we could talk for a long time. We could, because I think maybe that, because we're going to do malignancy of unknown origin, because I think for both cord compound brain mets, it's the malignancy of unknown origin that's the really difficult, that are often the really difficult ones. And I don't want us to sort of eat into too much of that. Does anybody have any sort of final comments from the panel? I'm looking to Costas as well to help me here. You're ready to go for coffee. Anybody final comments? No. Okay. Yeah. I'm asking about the quality of radiology images that you get through. Is there any work that needs to be done there to improve what you get through the pathway or through the neuro MDT, or are you happy with? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think the radiology generally okay. is good. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, maybe the grading on the, the cord compression. Um, because yeah. that would be useful if it comes from you, and then we can communicate that to the radiology leads in individual trust to say this is... Okay, yeah, that's great. We're getting some really useful points out here, aren't we? Yep. One final one. So, sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, it's just a request actually. I was just wondering, so um, I've actually just been recently added to the subgroup um, for the MSCC team at the Christie um, and I'm working with Lena to try and work on our nursing care, bowel care guidelines. Um, and obviously there's a lot of questions around pressure ulcer care as well. And so it's just really a request to kind of try and pick some of your brains as well as to kind of things that you might already have in place in the training that you do, particularly in Salford that we can link up with. So I might just come and find you afterwards if that's okay. Um, yeah, so we could probably put you in touch with uh, Rachel Brennan, who's our spinal specialist nurse. So she uh, goes out to a lot of other sites for training. Um, I think she's done a little bit with the Christie's actually. Um, so I'll exchange emails um, and then, you know, I should be more than happy to come out and do some training with your guys um, surrounding that as well as um, we can obviously sort with you about the pressure care situation as well. So fantastic. Thanks okay. so much. Thank you. At least you've got the you've got the names now, you know who to talk to. <laughs> right. Anything else? I'm sorry, not everybody's spoken, but everybody happy to go for tea break now? And please tea, but also do look around and score the posters and put the stickers on the sheets if you haven't done so already. Thank you. And thank thank you to all our speakers for a fantastic afternoon.